So my name is David Richter. My job title, I'm an assistant professor in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department here at Notre Dame. So my place of employment is at Notre Dame University, obviously. Uh, my current residence, I just live maybe six miles or so from campus, so I try to bike in and, you know, it's close by. Uh, my hometown, I was originally born in Omaha, Nebraska. I lived there for about five years. I moved to uh, a town north of Chicago, and I lived there maybe from five to 11 or so. And then I moved down to Dallas, Texas, or outside of Dallas, Texas, in Arlington. Uh, and I, from sixth grade onwards, I went to, you know, to high school there and then bounced around for school until I wound up here. So I went to undergrad at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, uh, Massachusetts. I studied mechanical engineering. And then right after graduating, I went straight into graduate school. I went to Stanford University to get my master's and my PhD, also in mechanical engineering. Uh, after about f almost five years, four and a half or so years, I went to do a postdoc at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and then right after that came here to Notre Dame. In high school, I would say the, the biggest thing that drew me to it was just math physics. I mean, I took an AP calculus course and I took an AP physics course, and I really, really enjoyed both of them. And um, it just seemed like, well, engineering was the best place to go. I didn't want to become a math major, and I didn't want to become a physics major for reasons I don't remember why, but I thought, all right, I can actually do things with an engineering degree. And at the time, the default was just sort of mechanical. I didn't know what else I wanted to do, so I went to mechanical. My history is a, as an engineer, I mean, I, it's been entirely academic, I would say. Uh, you know, I actually worked in a mechanic shop for a while through summers in college, but I don't know if I would count that. It was fun to sort of see what people actually do and, you know, the devices that I would hopefully someday be working on or designing. Um, or at least that was my thought at the time. But, you know, it started, I started doing some undergraduate research the senior year of undergrad, and I enjoyed it. And I knew, I remember having a conversation with my, so, I mean, I think like here, we have academic advisors and we have um, sort of just people that we get along with, right? So, you know, the person I was, do the professor I was doing research with, I had a really close connection with him, but my academic advisor was someone I'd met twice. I, I mean, the entire time I was there. I never had him for class or anything. And I remember telling him one day that, you know, I really like teaching. I really like my calculus class. I would love to go teach high school math. And he said, no, 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 you don't want to, you don't want to teach high school, you know, you should go to graduate school and uh, try to become a professor, which was not even a thought that I had had up till that point. And I said, okay, I mean, I do enjoy the research I'd been doing in this other lab. And so I said, all right, you know, I started talking to him about, you know, which schools to go to and so on. And I was able to go straight into graduate school. And it was really the connection. I mean, my advisor, who, the, the person who ended up being my advisor at Stanford was sort of friends with this person I'd done research with in undergrad, so there was a connection there. And so I just jumped straight into doing more research. I mean, I started even early, you know, the semester didn't start till September, and I did some research over the summer, um, some experiments actually, and then I knew I wanted to get into numerical simulations of something, of fluid mechanics. I mean, that was the, the general topic that I wanted to study. And so I did. So I spent the next, again, four, four and a half years doing a PhD. Um, about halfway through, I decided that I hated, hated the idea of becoming a professor, and I thought I would never do it. Um, you know, the, the work, I mean, yeah, there's sort of a mid-PhD doldrums that I think everyone hits at some point, and so I remember that hitting kind of hard and, you know, not I was enjoying the day-to-day -day work, but I didn't understand the whole point of it, and I had no idea what I wanted to do, and I knew that, you know, teaching just didn't seem like the right avenue. And so um, when it came time to leave, I was applying all over the place and considering all kinds of different options. I should also add that I was married, so I got married immediately after 
undergrad. I mean, my wife and I met in the computer lab. She was also mechanical engineering. We met in the computer lab at UMass. We got married two weeks after graduation, and she moved with me to California, which was fantastic. That was somewhere that she had never been before. Neither of us had ever been before. Um, so by the time I was graduating with my PhD, we had two kids, and we knew we didn't want to live in California. And so, you know, we were trying to find jobs. And the thought of, well, you know, maybe I should go do a research stint somewhere to go to just see if I like doing independent research, because that was the biggest part of why I didn't want to become a professor. You know, I had this opportunity to go to the National Center for Atmospheric Research and sort of shift gears in what I was studying. So I thought, all right, let's do this. And so we went there, and it was great. I mean, Boulder, Colorado is nice if you guys have ever been there. And, uh, but it was somewhat unsatisfying. And so I actually almost left after a year and took, I had a job opportunity, I think it was at GE, General Electric in upstate New York, that I was, I almost took and left the postdoc halfway through, again, because I didn't know I wanted to teach, or I, or I knew I didn't really want to teach, and I was still on, on the fence, and, you know, my wife wanted to be closer to her family, which is on the East Coast, and there was a lot of stress there, which maybe I'll get into a little bit later. But then, um, but then I, we stuck it out, and then the opportunity at Notre Dame came up, and so now I'm here, continue, trying to continue the research that I'd started doing it at NCAR. And so the reason I found myself now in a, a civil and environmental engineering and earth sciences department is because I started to study fluid mechanics of the atmosphere and the oceans. And so here, there's an environmental fluid dynamics group which, whose focus is exactly that. I mean, it fits in, in perfectly with that group and sort of joins forces with environmental engineering and even some of the earth sciences faculty and, and I guess, the rest is history. So now my research focuses on, on that, right? Turbulence and motions in the atmosphere and the ocean. This is something that I kind of enjoy sharing, but I don't share all that often. Um, you know, I was born and raised Catholic, I suppose. I mean, my mom wasn't Catholic. My dad was, but they knew that they wanted to raise me and my brothers something. And by default, I mean, my mom wasn't really raised anything. And so it sort of defaulted to what my dad was. But when I lived in Chicago as a kid, when they got divorced, and that's when we moved down to Texas, um, the, we kind of stopped going and, you know, my mom was going through obviously a very difficult time. And so we stopped going to church for a while, but then she, you know, really made the effort of sending us back. By that time, she'd actually gone to our, our CIA. And I believe she and I actually had our first communion together, this, not together at the same time, but the same year. And, you know, I had my first communion and then shortly after, well, at, you know, the Easter vigil, she was welcomed into the church. Um... And so by that time, you know, so we were going to a Catholic church in Texas all through high school, but it was, I mean, I can look back and say that it was just going through motions. And, you know, there wasn't much, for me at least, I mean, not for her. She was an excellent, excellent role model in all of this. Um, and then around, so in 10th grade, I was in confirmation class, and I thought the confirmation class was terrible. I mean, it was absolutely terrible. It was useless. And, and I think, I mean, I still think that today. And at the end of it, I thought, this is ridiculous. I mean, this is, I've learned nothing in this class about faith or anything. So I actually chose not to get confirmed. Um, my, my confirmation sponsor was my uncle, my dad's brother. He's a priest in Iowa. And he lets me know now, I didn't realize this at the time, that my grandmother, so my dad and his mom, was really upset by this decision, which, I mean, that, yeah, that message never filtered down to me, but I just kind of said, look, it doesn't make any sense. This, I mean, I don't, I don't have any idea what I'm doing. And so I finish out high school, more just questioning than anything else, and then went to college and just really started to seek the answers myself. You know, I, I would go to the Newman Center at the UMass campus uh, to church. I mean, a lot of prayer, but then a lot of, I mean, one of my favorite things to argue was, well... And all these things that happen in life that people attribute to God, and my mom had a whole host of them, you know, things that helped her through this entire, you know, the divorce and move and so on. 
you know, as not cynical as possible, and I would say, well, I mean, a lot of that's just coincidence, right? That was my favorite thing to say. You know, I, I don't understand how, you know, people can attribute certain things to God, whereas other things, you know, just act, you know, are coincidental. And, you know, because you can have it going both ways. But then there was a couple instances. I mean, it was, you know, one of them was just getting stuck. My car broke down. I was visiting some friends out in Texas Tech, which is out in West Texas, and my car broke down. Um, and, I mean, I had no idea what to do. I actually called my friend's dad, and he said, well, try to get to a Dodge dealership, because it was a Dodge truck. And I said, well, I mean, I'm in the middle of West Texas. I mean, the, the, I don't think there are, I mean, there are no big cities around here. The next one is, you know, I'm 80 miles or something away. And, you know, it was one of these things, I, I go into town, and I go to the first, you know, mechanic shop or something, and they say, I say, you know, look, my transmission is busted in some way that I don't know. And he said, well, I'm completely booked. He said, but hey, you should go down, you know, just across town to the new Dodge dealership that opened up. I thought, well, that's pretty weird. I mean, I'm in this tiny town, you know, 80, mi 80 miles outside of the next largest city, and, you know, there is a Dodge dealership here. And I remember at that point, you know, this was one of those things that I would have normally attributed to coincidence, right? And, and this was finally the time where I really started to feel like, no, I mean... There's something more going on in life, I would say. I mean, there's something, you know, someone looking out for us in times of struggle and, and so on. Um, so from that point, I mean, it really started to kick into high gear. And so I forget exactly what year. So then a year, maybe a year or two into college, I actually went back to my home parish and I said, all right, I would like to get confirmed. <laughs> and he said... Essentially, great, if you'd waited one more year, you would have had to go through the class again. But my younger brother was actually going through at the same, I mean, he was going through the same, so it was three years after I had, had not gotten confirmed. And so I said, this is something I really do want to do. And I told my, my uncle, and he was very excited. My grandmother, she was also very excited at this point. Um, and so me and my younger brother got confirmed at the same time. And since then, it's just been... I mean, every day trying to grow in this and, and sort of trust in what God has for us. And I mean, you know, ever since then, it's just been repeated instances, good and bad, of just, you know, there is, you know, I don't like to say there's a reason for everything, but there's definitely guidance and there's definitely insight you can gain about what God wants you to do with your life based on, you know, the events around you. Um... And so this is something that I, I, you know, I wish I were better at, but it's, you know, it's something that it's, it's quite fun to, to grow in every day. I mean, the faith journey. Try to understand more what God wants me to do. Try to, you know, release yourself to his will as best and as often as possible, which is never, never easy to do. I would love to say something about how the research I do you know, about, you know, I study hurricanes and how you can better forecast them, um, how you can better understand the physics of what's going on, you know, with, with waves and spray and winds and all kinds of things going on and in situations where, you know, you don't have much information because it's so hazardous, and how that somehow benefits society. And honestly, I, I don't, you know, most of the time I, I enjoy what I do, but I don't see that as the outlet for my faith coming into my everyday life. I mean, for me... Like I said, it was really, so when, I guess I'll get into this now, the, 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 the postdoc that I did in Boulder, about halfway through, um, like I said, it was, we almost left a year early, you know, it was a two-year postdoc, and it's, I mean, it's a fairly prestigious postdoc, actually, and so a lot of my friends, you know, the, the couple that I mentioned that I was, I was considering leaving were thinking, you know, are you crazy? I mean, this is, this is an opportunity that, you know, it's really competitive to get into. You know, how, why would you turn your back and go to a non-academic job? I said, look, I have no idea what I want to do. Um, and at one point, I just remember thinking, like, you know, you have all these decisions to make, all these strings pulling you in different directions. My wife wanted to be on the East Coast. I didn't care really geographically, but I didn't even know what I wanted to do. I mean, I was so lost in terms of direction. I mean, you know, we had two kids. 
I didn't know where I wanted to be. I didn't know what kind of job I wanted to have. I mean, like I said, I didn't think I even wanted to become a professor at all. So I thought, well, that might be completely out. I had an opportunity. I had offers. I mean, it wasn't a matter of not being able to find a job. I had one at GE. I had another one at Shell Oil Company in Houston, because that's near my family. Um, a friend of mine works at a hedge fund, and he actually contacted me out of the blue and said, you know, would you be interested in something like this? So it wasn't quite an offer, but you know, it was a it was a opportunity or at least a, a an avenue I could have explored. But I had no idea, and it was extremely stressful to have these identity crises daily. And you know, it it finally came down to like, look, God, I have no idea what to do. I mean, clearly, I you know, I'm not going to just be able to make a, a you know a couple pros and cons list and figure this out just completely from a rational perspective. Like, can you please just guide us? And I had this conversation with my wife. She said, look, you know, if you do want to teach, where would you teach? Let's, let's, let's start narrowing it down. I said, look, if I were to teach, the only place I would even consider is a strong Catholic university with a good research program. And that's a pretty short list. And the, so, so I, you know, I said, right, so I'm going to go to Notre Dame's website. I'll see if they have any opportunities. And lo and behold, there's an opportunity for someone who does environmental fluid mechanics, you know, and particularly modeling. I thought, well, okay, that is exactly what I do. So I mentioned this to my postdoc mentor. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I know the, the search committee chair there. And, you know, that is something that you would fit into. And, you know, so Joe Fernando in our department was instrumental in this. And, and everything just, I mean, everything came into line, right? I mean, it was, I mean, in my life, there's, you know, aside from my children and my marriage, I would say, there's been never any other time where it's been so clear what God wants me to do. And it was obvious that, I mean, all the stars aligned. I interviewed, I mean, it was a perfect fit. I got along with people. And so then, I mean, it was like, all right, I, I, my wife even says now, I came back from the interview and she said, well, how does it went? How did it go? And I said, it went really well. And she said, immediately she knew, she's, she started telling her sisters that that's where we're going. Before we even knew if I would have an offer. I mean, she just, she knew that this was an answer to a lot of both of our prayers. And she was a little bit apprehensive. You know, it wasn't quite East Coast. Um, but it's been truly amazing being here. I mean, it's it's just been fantastic. And I, I would say it fulfills me and her in a way that I don't think any of those other opportunities would have. And I don't think we would have gotten here if I hadn't been, well, eventually open to what God wanted me to do. It took a while, but we finally got there, I'd say. So day to day, um, as an engineer, I guess it's kind of funny to say as an engineer. I mean, I feel like the, the engineers are the people who work at these jobs that I didn't go into. Uh, they're the engineers actually doing things. I, you know, for me, it's a lot of interacting with students, both undergraduates and graduate students. And so, you know, I, and I absolutely love it. And, and teaching is obviously part of it, but, you know, teaching and prepping, prepping for class is maybe, you know, a small fraction of the time that I spend in a day. A lot of it is having one-on-one -on -one individual meetings, particularly with graduate students, you know, about the progress of their research, meeting with undergraduate students or, or students who, you know, in classes that I'm teaching about homework problems or things like this. Um, there's a lot of sort of mentoring meetings that I have with, with students and then, you know, a lot of reading and writing. I mean, I, I guess that would, you know, writing papers and writing proposals is a big part of my job. Um, but by far the most enjoyable part is interacting with the students. That's, I mean, hands down, the, the best part. Sure. So the, the projects that I study are mainly related to trying to model transport and, you know, fluid mechanics in the atmosphere, again, in the ocean, but mainly the atmosphere, um, particularly when you have either hazardous conditions or, or, or conditions outside that would be very difficult to go out and measure from an observational point of view, and particularly ones where there's something flying around. So I call it a dispersed phase, but, you know, something. So 
one of the problems that I work on a lot is spray. And so, you know, inside of a hurricane, for example, you get really, really high winds. And the winds rip off spray, and I mean, they rip off water from the tops of waves. And all these water droplets get carried around throughout the entire, what we call the boundary layer in the atmosphere, in the lower, you know, 100 meters of the atmosphere, say. And there's a lot of things that could happen because of having all this water suspended in the air, but it's unclear about what actually does happen, just because it's so difficult to, you know, you can't take a boat out, out into, you know, 20 meter swell and, you know, 150, min 150 mile an hour winds. Um, so what I do is I try to recreate these situations numerically. So I, you know, I solve the equations of fluid motion, which we know pretty well, and I try to solve them in a way that helps us understand, okay, what can and can't spray do when you actually suspend it in high winds? You know, if you've got a bunch of water droplets evaporating in an otherwise really high wind turbulent environment, you know, do you increase the amount of heat that ev eventually goes from the ocean to the atmosphere? I mean, it, after all, that's what fuels the hurricane. Um, and without knowing that, you know, it, you're kind of stymied in your, your efforts to, you know, predict hurricanes properly if you don't actually understand what's going on inside of them. And so I really try to use numerical simulations uh, on, you know, large supercomputing clusters throughout you know, here at Notre Dame, but also throughout the country to simulate these environments to better understand them in ways that we can't get through direct observation. Um, so, yeah, so one of the projects I have going on now, well, two of the projects actually are related to this, this question. One is more related to, you know, do these spray droplets actually change the energy exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere because if they do, if they enhance the heat, then they can actually fuel the hurricane. They can actually, if they were actually providing more heat for it, they could actually make it more intense or stronger or larger. Um, if they do the other way around, right, they can damp it out. And, and the question is when this actually becomes important. Another problem that I'm working on is related to uh, the, you know, the suspension of spray, but it's more like once it gets airborne, then what happens to it? Um, you know, a lot of it just falls straight back in, but some of it evaporates, and so by evaporating, you can increase the humidity of the atmosphere. A lot of the small aerosol particles, the salt aerosol particles, can go long, long distances away from where they were generated, uh, and they can, I mean, they mess with the atmospheric radiation budget, so they can actually absorb or scatter radiation coming from the sun. They can, you know, be the cause or the sort of site of a lot of, uh, atmospheric chemistry reactions, um, and they can seed clouds and, and other things. And so I'm looking at a lot of where these things go, how they get to where they go, you know, what size droplets would you expect at certain heights and that kind of thing. And now I'm trying to expand to dust, and it's the same kinds of questions, right? You get a lot of wind over a desert or a beach, um, how much sand gets suspended and where does it go, how far does it travel, and because a lot of the minerals that we get in North America, and especially the Caribbean and Florida, is coming from the Saharan Desert. I mean, I think a lot of the potassium in, uh, in a lot of the Caribbean islands originate from northern Africa, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, um, because they can be, you know, dust and other aerosols can be transported very, very long distances. So understanding sort of the small-scale emission processes is, is uh, very important. So I'd say that, that's where my research falls as a whole, but along with the transport, then I get to start working with people like Diogo Bolster, a couple doors down, about, okay, what about the transport of other things, not just actual droplets or actual grains? Um, what about, you know, if there's a continuous spill of something in, in a turbulent environment? My expertise is really about turbulent environmental flows. Um, you know, it mixes it all around, and, and how would you actually try to model this without having to solve the equations that I have to solve every time, you know? How, do you, how could you do this from a very operational point of view rather than you know, having to use supercomputers like I need to do in my, my research? And, and so working with guys like him about the transport of anything. I mean, I, he works on where you know, fish DNA goes. And so, okay, how do you, how do you actually model the, you know, the, the, the motion or the transport of fish DNA or something like that um, in a turbulent environment? And so overall, those are the kinds of questions that I like to work on. So first, I really like that question. I mean, just because you bring, there's a lot of, 
I don't get asked that often, but you know, there's a lot of just, oh, what advice would you give to the graduating class? But having this caveat on there about you know, someone who wants to bring their faith into their work and into their life and live a life of virtue, I mean, that, that to me is what makes, I mean, that to me is why I love being at Notre Dame so much, is that because I can, you know, at appropriate times, obviously, try to encourage that in, in students. And the, the biggest piece of advice, I mean, from my own personal experience, is just try to find some quiet to listen to what God wants you to do. I mean, and it could be anything. And this is something, you know, getting a, a, a degree of some kind, whether it's civil or environmental engineering or mechanical or whatever, electrical, you know, there are too many stories that I know of to count where people wind up in completely different... I mean, I, you know, all my mechanical engineering degrees, I studied non-Newtonian fluid mechanics in my PhD, and I do nothing with that now. But it's not useless. I mean, it, it can help form me in ways that I don't... I mean, in ways that I do understand, but in also ways that I don't. Um, you know, so... Not feeling pigeonholed or that you're expected to do anything, but at the same time, it's not just this vast space of opportunity that you can just pick and choose as you please. You know, if you ask God, he will tell you in one way or another the way that he wants you to go. And that is not easy to do, and it's not something that, you know, it's easier said than done. Um, you know, but if you can find peace and prayer, I mean, those are invaluable weapons to sort of the despair of not knowing what to do or feeling lost in life. And, you know, if you think of your degree as an engineer as just equipping yourself with being able to handle you know, or being able to serve others with, then God is going to use you as an instrument in however he sees fit. And that is an incredibly comforting thought. And, you know, so not only will you not be stressed out about where to go, but you will also be almost guaranteed to go somewhere where your skills, talents, training, and all of that will benefit him and, you know, those around you. And, you know, and again, just to be open to the fact that that might not be what you think it will be now, sitting as an undergraduate or sitting, I mean, or even a graduate student. It's, you know, this happens a lot. And, and like I said, in my own personal experience, finding sort of the peace to stop trying to control where I'm going and, you know, completely go through it as just a series of, of you know, pros and cons is just not a very fulfilling way to do it. And, you know, trusting yourself to God and what he wants you to do is, is something, I mean, he'll help you through every single struggle that you encounter and he'll connect you with the opportunities to use your talents and skills to the best that they can be used for.